Hi there, and welcome to the Love or Leave the Law podcast with your hosts, Adam Olette and Casey Berman. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Love or Leave the Law podcast. I'm Casey Berman with my co-host, Adam Olette, and we are so happy to have you. Uh, thank you again for being part of the community. And I'm extremely excited for this episode. We have Dan Lear, uh, Director of Industry Relations for AVO, um, uh, with us today. Dan, thank you so much. Uh, for being here. We really appreciate it. Um, everyone, Dan is an old friend of mine. We've known each other a number of years, yeah. met for coffee in Seattle. Uh, I've uh, seen him grow and in, in what he's doing, and it's just a, a real pleasure to see. He's Director of Industry Relations for AVO up in Seattle. Um, let me just take a second, Dan, I'll embarrass you a bit of a little intro, but I want everyone to know who you are and what you're doing, why we're having you, and then we'll uh, we'll jump into some some great questions in the next episode. If you want to embarrass me for the whole hour, Casey, that's totally fine. <laughs> cool. We like yes. that. Yeah, go yes. right uh, everybody, um, Dan is someone special. He's in the Seattle area, travels all over the country, though. Um, he's the co-founder of Seattle Legal Technology. Um, he does innovation meetups, which is kind of this self-styled legal hacking group that meets regularly. Um, he's uh, a lawyer. Uh, he works at AVO. He's a technologist. He explores, identifies really unconventional ways uh, to improve the law, to help law firms, and, and people really optimize the process, which we talk a lot about and, and is one of, of Adam's pet projects. Um, he's blogged and written extensively, and really check out his blog, Right Brain Law, for, for a lot of what he's written. Um, he's also been featured in a ton of publications from the ABA Journal, Law Practice Today, Law Technology Use, NW Lawyer, Above the Law, and a bunch of other press. Um, in 2015, he was named to Fast Case 50, a group of entrepreneurs, innovators, and trailblazers in the legal profession. Um, in 2014, he was honored with the Washington State Bar Association's President's Award for his advocacy of legal technology. Find him out on Twitter at Right Brain Law. Um, oh, yeah, by the way, he practiced for six years um, uh, as, an, as an attorney. He worked for two lean kind of new law uh, law firms designed and implement online program. I could go on and on. Received his BA from BYU and his JD MBA from Seattle University. We're going to talk today about technology. Um, we're going to talk today about how to optimize, how to get better, what Dan sees is coming down the path, um, and then just a whole other sort of thing. So everyone, really happy to have you. Dan, welcome. How are you? Cool. Uh, I'm well. So yeah. so pleased to be here, guys. I'm, I'm always excited to talk with folks who... Uh, who are like-minded and thinking about how to kind of think about uh, what we do as lawyers and, and legal practitioners uh, differently or and from a unique angle. So the, the feelings are mutual. Well, thank you, man. And you've always been that way. I mean, I know you've been kind of in, in my life when I started to leave law behind a year, a few years ago, kind of that always that trailblazer and just loved reaching out. So people know about AVO, avvo.com people know about avo but but tell me specifically about your role at avo um and, and what you're doing there right now Let, let's hear about it sure and i'll i'll try to speak a at least a little bit casey to some of the conversations that we've had earlier yeah or at least kind of use that as a jumping off point so uh when we met i was a practicing attorney who was at least didn't feel like the the traditional practice of law fit very well for me um, but still felt very passionately, I think, as both, both of you gentlemen do, and probably actually both as, as, as probably your listeners do as well, that um, felt passionately about the legal system, about the legal sector, about the role of lawyers in society. Um, and so yeah. still, you know, while, while I didn't want to keep doing the, you know, kind of traditional legal thing, was looking for an opportunity to, to keep one foot in that world. Right. Um, and the story of how I got here, which is always an interesting one, but I won't bore you with, uh, uh, is, is long, but, but effectively um, sort of got to know the folks at AVO um, and they, they, they basically said sort of, hey, we see that you've got a, um, a developing reputation or brand or network of folks um, who are listening to you, who are paying attention to you. We, we like your message. We like sort of who you are and your persona. And then we, we also, you know, Avo said, we also have a need for someone to do what you're doing. Right. Um, some of it was more practical. Uh, the company knew it was going to grow. And to date, it had been mostly our CEO and our general counsel who had been doing a lot of the speaking, a lot of the writing, a lot of the outreach. Yeah. And they 
we said like we we need a less expensive resource <laughs> um and so uh i was like hey i'm, I'm your huckleberry That's right. um, hmm. but but also the, you know they as they expected the company to grow and the company's profile to grow it made sense to have sort of one more pair of boots on the ground one more person out there kind of reaching out and involving themselves in in key legal technology conversations and so that was how my gig came about that the title always feels a little bit kludgy. I don't really know that there's a there's a better way to describe it. I I describe myself sort of as a legal technology um, evangelist, um, or you know, sort of a um, uh, I do outreach. For all Dan, let me ask you a question because sure. I, I want to get in that, but I do think that it's extremely important what you did, which was to build a brand. I think it's great for people who want to leave the law that they build a brand in other areas, even before or once they've gone to a non-law career, but also with, with those like Adam who helps people kind of refresh their practices is to build a brand, whether it's within that specific area of practice or, or in something else. How do you build your own personal brand? How do you do that? You don't have to spend, I know it could take hours, but like yeah. just a minute or two, how do you build that brand? So, so I'll, I mean, I'll say two quick things and then we can obviously talk about this. I mean, it's really interesting for me and, and, and it's funny, Casey, like I actually, when, when we first met sort of, that was kind of my exercise of like figuring out what that meant for me. I remember um, that. And, and, and honestly for me, and this is, I'll, 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 I'll respond sort of how it kind of emerged for me, which may feel kind of anecdotal, but then I'll try to put some more kind of structure around it. I, for me, it was, it was purely an exercise of feeling like I have to do something different and I sort of don't know what to do, but I know I have to do something. And so like, I just literally started reaching out and, and talking to and really telling my story and kind of sharing my passion with, with just about anyone who would listen. Um, <laughs> And, and, and I, yeah. have, I have a fair amount of, of charisma and energy. And so that, that helped me. Um, and, 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 you know, again, there are a lot of sort of lines that, that or dots that were connected along the way. Um, but, but I will to sort of put some structure around it. So, so, and, well, so, so for me, it was really just kind of an outgrowth of who I am. Yeah. Um, but I think, you, I think a lot of lawyers can take that message and, and think about how they can apply it in their lives, right? Um, and we, I'm, you know, totally happy to talk about this because I think it's thinking about one of those things as we move forward, both kind of as lawyers in our professions, as well as kind of law firms or businesses. Um, I, I think that, that, the, that consumers today and even other lawyers, if they are your market, um, are they're increasingly savvy yeah. and they're increasingly sort of able to kind of sift um, and, and really, I mean, really what I think it comes down to is authenticity. Yeah. Um, and so they can tell sort of, and, and, and that notion of kind of whether you want to call it brand, whatever it is, um, what, what you need to do. And again, I'm, I'm using a lot of big words that are probably not really helpful. So let me, let me try to sum it up. What, what you need to do is kind of figure out what it is you want to do yeah. and what are the things that you want to do well, or what are the things that you do well, and then try to figure out sort of where that intersection is and then chase them down. And so like for me, and I'll, I'll quickly wrap this yeah, up. Yeah. But for me, it was like, I really like speaking. I really like getting in front of people. So I was looking for opportunities like that. And then another piece of it was, I really enjoyed writing. So I started a blog, right? And I just started throwing stuff out there. And not everybody is like me. I totally yeah. get that. But there are so many ways today, whether you want to leave the law, whether you want to stay in it, whether you want to do something else, there's so many ways that you can express yourself so many ways that you can tell your story, so many ways that you can, you know, kind of build a persona. And again, yeah. it doesn't have to look like the way you've done it or I've done it or Adam's done it. It can be any number of ways, but it's, I think it really comes down to sort of why are you doing this? Yeah. Um, and, 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 and kind of what do you want to get out of it and what do you do well? Um, and then how do you sort of, um, how do you sort of do those things to, to sort of grow uh, people's awareness of you. I, you know, I think it's great. And I want to get to the industry trends and technology in a sec, but what you really did is you found what we call your unique genius. Mm -hmm. You were honest and open. This is what I do. Well, here are the things I don't do. Well, here are the things right. that I do do well. And you just got out there. You talked to as many people you and I met in Seattle together. Yep. You talk to as many people as you can. And 
I just, I talk to my clients all the time when I talk about leaving the law is get out there. We have a structure and a plan, but at the same time, when you're out there creating things, you create opportunities like you just did with Avo. And I remember when, when you told me, you emailed me that you were starting at Avo, I said, well, of course, like it made total sense. You had, you had made all those connections. So um, that's great. I, I think part of the problem that we have as a, a profession is a lot of us are introverts. And I was before I started practicing law and I'm, I'm not in a party situation, but in a group of people that I don't know, I'm a bit of an introvert. And so, so a lot of people coming to me now, they're left brain, which most of us are, and they're introverted. And this is one of the things that we need to overcome uh, as lawyers before we can get out there and really meet people. Just let go of that introvertedness and realize you can be and do whatever you want and really start to connect with people because that's really what we don't do a lot of times. We stay in our office. We know how to practice law, but we, we're not out connecting with people. And I think, Dan, you hit the nail on the head and, and Casey as well. Get out and meet people. That's part of Casey's program. And get the hell out of your office and start to connect. That's it's right. the key. No, it totally is. Yeah, the totally. one thing, I guess the one thing I'd say, and not to push back again, maybe this can be a good conversation, I, I, I'm always a little hesitant because I am, I, I am really extroverted. Like the, I, that's how I, I mean, I process out loud. That's how my ideas come out. That's how I'm most effective is working in groups. And I, and I feel like I do have to acknowledge that not everybody is that way. Um, but I feel like there are so many ways today that you can, you know, to your point, Adam, that you can get out, yeah. right? Like you can sit from, you know, here and, and be on Twitter and yeah. be interacting with people. You can be writing, you can be, you know, drafting up random new legislation and submitting it to some, you know, your congressman or like, there are so many things that you can be making, so many ways, things you can be doing, ways that you can be making those connections. So yeah. even tonight, I know that the secret for, for a lot of introverts is to act like an extrovert and that's a whole nother discussion. But like, I, I, I do think that, you know, I feel like a lot of people, particularly lawyers might look at someone like him and be like, well, of course, like, he, he can't function if he's not interacting with another human being. Right, um, right. And I do want to say, like, I do think that's important, but I also think, like, you got to find that thing that feels comfortable to you. And, you, you know, yeah, it's going to, it's going to, it should be pushing you. It should be challenging you. It should be scary. But, it, you know, it yeah. may not be, like, the things that I did. And, and I think that the, the, the key there is, like, finding that thing that does create those connections, that does push you. Um, but it may not be going to networking events or standing in front of hundreds of people or, you know, whatever. I, I just, I, I kind of wanted to no, say. We're, great point. We're on the same page. Yeah. I agree. And uh, it, it's just, I think it's prevailing in our, but not everybody is an introvert. Clearly there are lots of you out there. Extra. Yeah. So it's, but this, I think it's, also it takes is, all kinds is, is we're not getting out of the, we're staying in the brief or staying in the yeah. word document on totally. our computer. We're not going to Twitter or Instagram. We're not creating an email. I mean, one thing that we talk about is you get clients coming in, create a video series. Like you're not in front of a bunch of people, but you're still nurturing that authenticity. Like you talked about. 100%. Yeah. 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 Okay. We'll have you back. We're going to talk about brand. You're going to be back a, again. We're, we'll have Clearly you Clearly, there's a lot of stuff to talk about here, here Dan. Um, so let's talk. What I'd like to do is, Dan, kind of talk more broadly in industry. You've got a pulse on legal market. You've got a pulse on legal tech. Um, I'd love to hear just some trends. We'd love to hear some trends on you know, where technology, who's doing things well, who's not doing things well when it comes to technology optimization, what, what regulations are getting in the way or, or non best practices that you see kind of with, uh, with when it comes to, to the law and technology. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Big question. Big question. Big question. Um, I'll, to, I'll to hit, some I'll, nuggets here and there. I'll hit a few themes and then I'll count on you guys to either keep me honest or direct me or push me in another direction. <laughs> Great. Um, I mean, I, it's funny. I think so. So you know, talk, and and so Avo focuses mostly on talking with um, solo and small firm attorneys, and particularly attorneys who service um, kind of everyday consumers. So that's where I spend most of my time. I think a lot of what I'm about to say will probably also apply to medium and larger size firms, or at least they could learn a lot. Um, but that's where you know that's where my head's at a lot of the time. I, I think one of the biggest keys these days is. Lawyers need to, and I've been reading a bit about this, kind of think in a more um, consumer-centric fashion. Mm -hmm. um, I think for so long, uh, you know, and again, this gets the, regular, the regulatory piece, which we may be able to talk to, but like to, to a large degree, for whatever reason, and really this is a nice sort of segue from where we were, lawyers would sit in their office 
and kind of opine on legal concepts and, you know, write and do research and do whatever. Um, and, you know, maybe they were fortunate enough to either have a book of business or people would find them or, you know, again, speaking from a regulatory perspective, the market was sufficiently closed that it was like, well, I guess I got to use that attorney because she's the only one in town kind of a thing. Right. Um, and, and I think, I think there's a few things that have happened. I think, first of all, we frankly have a lot more lawyers than we, than we used to. I think, you know, we, we know that the United States has far more than really in any other country. Um, but I think more than that, what's happened, I think, I, I, I'd argue it's twofold. I think to, to some extent, we all, you know, I, I would argue probably the three of us, um, I would, we probably engage pretty heavily with technology, but I think lawyers also tend to forget, they sort of, they forget that when they're not being lawyers, they are consumers and they, they sort of take that hat off. And so like they, the types of consumer experiences that we're all being conditioned to expect and enjoy right. um, are, are, are so convenient and so easy and so um, user friendly. Um, and, and, and lawyers to a large degree have sort of missed, missed that boat. Um, and it's like, Dan, so when you say that, it's the, it's, it's Amazon nurturing that relationship with you via email. It's, it's Starbucks giving you the discount for your app when they, because based on their data, they know you like such and such and such and a time. It's stuff like that, right? Totally. I mean, the yeah. classic example is Uber, right? I can pick up my phone or, or any, you know, any number of these food delivery services. I mean, just there's so many, you know, the, 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 the uh, you know, Slack and they're just, they're all built to to make whatever activity that you're going to do that much more, that much easier, that much right. more convenient. Right. Um, and, and lawyers have traditionally not um, thought in that way. And I think facing both an increasingly sort of competitive landscape, as well as a consumer who is increasingly finicky, uh, increasingly, frankly, doing their own research. That's right. Um, and rightly or wrongly, under the belief that they can do a lot of, or certainly learn and self-educate to a great extent before they even come to you. Yeah. And then I think the third piece is, frankly, a lot of these consumers are, are going around lawyers. Um, and, and a lot of lawyers like to point their fingers at companies like LegalZoom or all of the form sites out there. Um, you know, there's, there's a ton of online legal services. Um, but, but, but the fact of the matter is what we also know, and then there's tons of research that bears this out, consumers sometimes don't even know, and this is huge, they don't even know that the problem that they're facing in their life is a legal problem. Hmm. And therefore they don't even know that there could be a legal solution. Interesting. And then compound that with the fact that the types of services that lawyers are delivering are so non-consumer centric. It's like, Hey, come to my office and I'll charge you by the hour. And it <laughs> might, it'll almost certainly cost a lot, but I don't know how much it's going to cost. And at the end you might not even get a, a result that you want. That's right. But I'll be happier. That's right. Um, and like that's that is such an like a, a just and I and I and I mean this from the bottom of my heart because I, I want to yeah. see women succeed. I'm not trying to be cynical, but that is that's a really challenging I mean, think about any other consumer experience that you have where someone says, I'm not gonna tell you what it's gonna cost, I can't guarantee the outcome. Um, and like like it, it, it doesn't exist. Oh, you know, I would say, did he, I'm laughing with like the banks. I see it with banks. Like I have to mail a paper into a bank and I've been sitting on it. I got to get it printed up. I got to sign it. I got to send it in, you know, and I'm sitting there going, are you kidding me? I have to actually deal with paper and I, you know, and so, but maybe with banks, but you're right. Like it's it, to take the hours out of your day and to do this with no real quick resolution. We don't, that doesn't align with consumer habits. Anymore. And, and, and so, so what's happening again, you, you sort of compound this with other options out there, you know, the legal zooms and, and other companies of the world, but also like just the simple fact that like um, folks don't even know, that their problems are legal. That's huge. And, and like, it's, so of course they're going to go around us. And so I think there's, I, you know, again, I don't want to jump ahead too far, but I think there's so much opportunity for lawyers to sort of flip that script and be more effective in that, in this way. Um, if they can figure out how to communicate effectively to consumers about their value and, and then sort of backing that out, I think there are tons of ways that you can use technology, be it, social media, be it your website, you know, practice management, intake tools, um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, you know, all these simple kinds of things, um, chatbots, 
that can, that can improve that experience. But I think, and again, we can totally talk about this. I think sometimes we get on the hype train of certain technologies. We're like, oh, well, this can do this or this can do that. But at the end of the day, I think the most effective and powerful technologies are those that actually you don't see, right? Those that are seamless, those that effectively solve a consumer's problem um, without that consumer actually even ever knowing it, right? It's all, it's like the, the Wizard of Oz, right? Like pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Like that's, you know, you want an experience that's, that's, that's so much more seamless. And that's, that's really yeah. where we leverage off the power of technology. Wow. So what are some of the technologies that you're seeing where we can start to, to tell people that they're there, they're available, and here's what they do? Because I think that's the, the, the missing link that we have is a lot of lawyers just don't ever hear about some of this stuff. And there is movements to get the word out about some of them. But um, I, I think that there's not a lot of benefit that comes to the law. You know, if, if I'm sitting in a litigator's chair, I need to know the benefit that this software is going to provide to me and, and not just some fluffy video that I look on their website. Tell us more about some of these things you're seeing that you think could really be game changers for the profession and help us to deconstruct. How do we get to that point where we're, we're more cu customer or client, client centric, like I've always wanted to and I've, have been in my practice. Think about what the client is expecting and go above and beyond that. So what do you got in, up your sleeve here, Dan, to, to sh tell us today? Sure. So I'll, I'm going to step back actually and just say, I mean, from a baseline perspective, and again, I'm not sure, I'm not sure what you guys have talked about on your podcast. I'll need to start listening to uh, all the back -ish episodes uh, soon. But um, I mean, I think, I think every practice should be using some kind of practice management technology. Yes. That's, perfect. That, that is a no brainer. Um, and, and personally, I think that cloud-based practice management technologies are the way of the future. I agree. Um, and I, the, the sort of the pitch I make for, for cloud-based, and again, not super sure how tech-savvy your audience is, but just to, to sort of talk about the cloud quickly, like you think of the cloud as you're renting computing power from someone else uh, at some, on some remote server, and it's always secure, right? The, these folks have done a really good job yeah. sure that everything is secure. But, but, but what, that, what that means is, and this is why I actually, um, why I think it's so it's actually kind of relevant from an ethical perspective is what that means is you you can lose your laptop it can melt down something can happen right. to you right you can get sick you can and all of your files all of your interactions all of your correspondence is living in a place yeah. that, is, that is separate from you um, and I've, I've I've actually made the argument so there's a and and one company that I particularly like I don't necessarily you know. I, I'm not deeply embedded in this space, but one company I like is Clio. Um, they're very well known. Um, but the example I give is, so Clio gives a discount on their um, law practice management, uh, cloud-based law practice management uh, technology to people who are malpractice insurance uh, subscribers to the malpractice insurer Alps. Um, just, you know, they're a decent size, I think West Coast or right. Western region. I actually, I can see a world in which that flips where you get a discount on your insurance, on your insurance, malpractice insurance, yes. if you are a subscriber to Clio. And here's ah. why, right? Um, again, if something happens to you, someone can immediately come in and take over your practice. Yeah, that's right. But more than that, if you get a complaint lodged against you, your malpractice insurer can immediately log in, see how many times you've communicated with these people, what these correspondences have looked like, what the filings look like, like you know, on down the line. I mean, it's just like the, the analogy is, uh, I don't, and I don't, again, I don't know if you guys have been following this, but um, a lot of the auto insurance companies, um, and I actually saw this when I was riding in a ride sharing uh, in, a, in an Uber, they, uh, a lot of auto insurers, um, they now have the technology to basically have you plug something into your car yeah. that allows you to track how fast you're going, where you're yeah. going, all of that, right? How many miles you're driving, all that stuff. It's, totally. yeah, it's and, crazy. And then, they, and then they adjust your insurance accordingly. Right. Right, which I mean, again, like there's this whole so, question: right. should we be comfortable with that level of transparency? But That's it makes the question, whole, yeah. You know, it makes a whole lot of sense that, like, hey, if I'm really a safe driver and I have nothing to hide, like, why wouldn't I want that? And and similarly, like, there's a world in which that makes sense from a practice management perspective. So anyway, I've, I've spun off, but yeah, yeah. But this notion of like you should have a practice management, like that is that to me, that's like a no-brainer. 
Um, yeah, I, I used some law practice management stuff for 10 years before we went to mostly real estate. And then it was a, a practice management in terms of real estate law for the title company. But I can tell you that it's always CYA, right? Cover your ass. And the law practice management software will do that if you utilize it and you set it up correctly right. and you scan all the documents in there. All the emails go in there. Everything goes in there. So it's a portal so that you never forget what's happening. It reminds you of deadlines. It's a document storage. It's, it's all of that wrapped up. And I can tell you, if you're not using a law practice management software, you better get with the times. There, Clio, I've researched it. That is one of the better ones that I can see out there. Now, there's a multitude of them. And what I tell my consulting clients is pick the one that best represents what you need it for. I'll, I'll go to the end result. What, what is it that you want it to do? And then we, we, I help them find that. But I agree with you, Dan. I mean, this is like if you're, I was using it 10 years ago and before, and they're, they're, they were nothing like they are now. I mean, now it's like crazy what they do. So if you're not using it, you need to be. Yeah. Dan, what other technologies do you see? I know we talk a lot about ways to automate processes, optimize your practice. I mean, a lot of the pain points that we see with attorneys, and please add to it, but is they're overwhelmed, they're not making enough money, they're so on and so forth. What other technologies do you see there that not, you know, like you said, the hype train, but have actually added value to the practice, made more money, or, or given lawyers more free time? Yeah, so I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to, kind of weasel out of the question and then hopefully I'll come back and actually give you some. I mean, I love it. Here's, the, here's the problem with that is there, I mean, it's just, Adam just said it, right? You can set up a law practice management technology, but if you don't use it effectively, if you don't use it well, it's useless. Yeah. And, and really I'd actually step back and say, the question is not what technology and, and actually Casey, I'm, I'm probably just preaching to, to you, preaching to the choir. Like, um, and then Adam, I just don't know you as well, but I imagine I'm about to say something that you'd agree with hundred percent as well. The, the question is not what technology is going to save me from myself. Like yeah. the problem is you need a more effective business strategy yeah, that's right. and then the technology that you choose or, or, or then, then that strategy should drive the technology. That's there. right. That's exactly what that's I was fair just mentioning is that's the thought <laughs> is figure out what it is you need you want to do to market your firm to bring clients in to onboard them what is it you want it to do and and the problem is as far as i can see is that there isn't a lot of business strategy going on in the profession yep. <laughs> so yep. that's lacking in in yeah. most practices and especially the small and solo guys uh, and gals but uh I think that's really where my focus is, and this is part of the reason why we're doing this podcast is, yes, to help people leave the law, but you know, when Casey says I help people refresh, part of it is I help people build something that they weren't even close to having because they never thought of the business aspects of stuff, and when you're not a good business person, you could be the best lawyer around, but if you don't have clients walking in your door then how are you going to pay your bills? And so for me, it was always, what are the strategies that I can use to find these people, to get in front of them? And, and this is part of the reason why we're doing this podcast is to get that out in the open. Because regardless, if you're in the law or you're out and you're in business somewhere, you need to have some business acumen. Uh, and a lot of the people we've interviewed, like some of Casey's clients that have left the law, they had to figure that business acumen out because without it, they weren't going to leave the law in a, in a meaningful way and find something that they really love doing. Okay. So this is, hold on, time for one sec. I mean, we laughed about this and Dan, you, you agreed, but I mean, Adam, do you hear what you said? Like there is a huge lack of business strategy in the industry. Yeah. I mean, how crazy a comment is that? Like Dan, you're seeing well, that. It's sad. And, and Casey, I actually, I can send you guys a link to it. Um, I mean, just a couple do. we'll include it. We'll include it with the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Just a couple of years ago, I, I was at a, an American bar association meeting in front of a bunch of, um, like bar uh, executive directors and presidents. And one of them, I was on a panel and one of them stood up and said, you're trying to turn this profession into a business, but it already is angry. Well, <laughs> and it's okay. Like the That's two it. are not mutually exclusive. Right. They don't have to be. They don't have to be competing. What was he angry about? If I'm... Because because business is somehow inherently antithetical to to being a good or ethical lawyer. I see. And but you have to be in business if you're going to make a living as a lawyer. It's not the way it used to be where – we, there wasn't that many of us. There's 1.5 million of us now. And if you're going to be in the law, you got to know how to be in business. There is no two ways about it. The old timers, 
they, they, they push back on this. And I understand why. I interviewed a bunch of them for my book because I wanted to know what it was like to practice law in the glory days when there wasn't that many of us. But yeah. the fact of the matter is you have to be, and this is part of the reason why I started my work was because I saw so many lawyers. I go out and meet them. Hey, how's life? You know, I I just don't have that many clients. See, they would tell me that one-on-one. -on -one, and that's their biggest issue. And that's one of the reasons why I, I brought forth Esquire Academy because I love the business stuff. Most people don't. I love reading about marketing. I know there's something wrong with me. I understand that. I tell people that and they go, something's wrong with you. I love to read about business. And Casey and I are actually planning on doing a course on how to be an entrepreneur because it needs to be out there in the sunlight it needs to be in the, the, the uh, domain of lawyers because it's not been. We don't learn it in law school. And if you, even if you went to college like I did and, and got a business degree, you don't learn shit with that either. And so this is sorely lacking. And, and I, I love, Dan, that you're bringing this forth because it That's needs huge. to be said and it needs to continue to be said until people start to realize that they're missing out by not uh, learning business strategies and how to run a business. So Dan, are there examples, are there examples of lawyers, you don't have to name their names, but are there examples of lawyers or law firms doing this well? Uh, oh, uh, oh, 100%, 100%. And actually, that's where I was going to go next. So to actually answer your question, um, Casey, about um, what technologies should lawyers be using? So, I, and, and that's why I say it, it really, so you got to build the strategy, but then like, you know, the technologies that you use to build out your practice, once you have that strategy, they can, they can vary widely, right? right? If, you're, if you're a high volume practice, um, not really providing kind of a white glove service, then, you know, something like a chat bot or, you know, like some kind of um, simple auto, you know, responder, um, email, you know, whatever it is, those, that's what you want, right? Whereas if you're a, a higher end firm doing white gloves, like I know a woman um, who does kind of high end divorces in the greater Dallas area, and she actually built and is now trying to market her own practice management technology because she wanted it built in a very certain way. Right, sure. and, and I'm not, you know, I, I make no, I actually, I'd, I'd strongly recommend to most attorneys not to do that. She happens to be quite successful. So like, she had the resources and the wherewithal to build her own technology. I, I, I start with something off the shelf first and then move to that. Don't, don't, don't task me. But, but like, you know, it, so it really, yeah. you know, I've, got a, I've got a really good friend here in the greater, uh, in greater Puget Sound who runs an immigration practice. And he's kind of really into this notion of kind of customer development and understanding um, kind of, you know, client or consumer centricity. So he's constantly trying new things, tweaking his website, um, you know, tweaking ways that he handles his scheduling. He actually really likes to travel internationally. So like part of his goal is like, I'm going to spend two months out of the year in East Asia and I'm going to run my practice from there and I'm going to make it. Yeah, work. we already interviewed him. We interviewed him. Is that, oh, <laughs> is yeah. This, is this Greg McLawson? Yep. We already oh. interviewed him. I interviewed him. That's right. Adam yeah, man. I, he's awesome. I mean, <laughs> yeah. this is exactly what, why I interviewed because Casey had some, something going. He wanted to be on there, but yeah. Yeah. Greg was, he, he's exactly who I want the world to know about because yeah. he does, he's out there traveling for months on end and he's, he is customer centric. It's like, how can I do this better to serve my customer in a way where I wow them? And I call it raving fans because there's a book I read many years ago and this is exactly what I did with my firm. We're going to have Greg on again because he is, he's instrumental in teaching you what people are using right now. I mean, I've done it and I continue to do it in different ways based on what we're working on now, but he's rubber meets the road doing yeah. it now. And, and, uh, it was, it was, uh, it's information that everybody needs to hear. So that's yeah. so funny. As you were saying, Dan, I was like, Oh yeah, we know him. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. great. Yeah, that's so great. I mean, and there are, I mean, the, it, 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 there's a great attorney, again, um, uh, Jonathan Tobin, down in the uh, greater Los Angeles area. Uh -huh. His market is, he wants to work with creatives. Uh, Council for Creators is his, his firm. So what he developed was, and I'm, I'm sure in a sort of a customer development, from a, from a customer development standpoint, he tested this. He has a, um, a subscription plan where creatives pay him a certain amount of money every month, and they get like, I don't know what it is. I think it's like unlimited phone calls. They get access to um, a bank of documents. That's so they can ask him so many questions a month. Um, and again, like I'm sure he tested it 
Because, you know, that's a, you, you say something like that to lawyers and they're like, unlimited phone calls. Like, ah! Yeah. And, but it, and, never, it never pans out to be unlimited and it's not that many. I mean, Exactly. Yeah. And who knows, right? You don't know until you try something that's like right. that and until you understand your client and then you work your way back yeah. and sort of find out what is the impact to the, and what, what should I charge for that? Um, and so, the, and, and you know, and, and Jonathan, one of my favorite things, like, again, as a marketing sort of um, tool, he, he rolled out this, um, he was offering a, what did he call it? Oh, oh, so, so I guess in the creative space, and again, not a space I'm super familiar with, but you know, to his credit, he is, um, a lot of t- t- things, something that his clients struggled with a lot was, people would basically say like, hey, come and put your artwork in my gallery or come and play this gig or come and do whatever. Um, and we won't pay you, but it's worth it for, for exposure. Mm-hmm. And so, and like a lot of creators like end up doing this and then they end up hating themselves for doing it. And so he totally as a joke um, created this landing page, a work for fame contract. <laughs> um, and, he, and he rolled it out and he's like, I didn't get any business from it, but I got like 300 or 400, or maybe thousands of emails. Right, and, right. Yeah. And, now, and now he has this big email distribution list and I'm sure some of those have converted into clients. Well, and oh, he's created good, a brand. He's a thought leader, kind of like how you did. That's right. Before you moved Avo, you know, he's creating this brand for himself. Totally. That's so yeah. good. So yeah, there's a couple of examples. But again, for me, the question is not what technology you're using, although there's lots of interesting ways that you can do that. Yeah. The question is what's your strategy and then picking the technology that's going to enable you to deliver that, that, that product, what you're aiming for, build that business in the way that you've kind of structured it. And we've got a, a few minutes left, but Dan, I want to let you get on with your day and I want to turn to Adam. But I, but, you know, I think that's huge. And I just want to, on that point, kind of, close it up where it's, it takes some looking in the mirror. I mean, you know, what does that mean? Build your own yeah. strategy. I mean, you need to look in the mirror. You need to reflect. You need to really work with someone or do on your own. It's like, what do you want out of your practice? You need to be honest. Like there's some, some reflection there that, that you need to do to kind of lead to this idea of what a strategy is. Yeah. I, I think the other sort of really key piece for a lot of lawyers and, and this is hard. And I, and I, again, I, I did, I've been entrepreneurial to some extent. I haven't lived this. So like I, you know, I sometimes feel a bit hypocritical saying something like this, but I fundamentally it makes sense to me, which is sort of, you have to look in the mirror and say, I I am not the lawyer for every client, right? right. I need to figure out how I can target and cultivate a relationship with those specific clients that I want to bring to my business. Yeah, I call them the ideal client. Who is your ideal client? Most attorneys and and even small business people, they don't know who that person represents. And so if you don't even know who they represent, how are you going to deliver killer, kick-ass customer service to them? Because you've never even delineated who they are. So it's powerful. And what's hard about that, what's hard about sort of the converse of that or the opposite of that is what you end up doing is servicing everyone who comes in the door um, and you don't service them very effectively because you're right. not able to build economies of scale, right? right. You're teaching yes. yourself something new for every client who comes in the door. Um, okay. And again, maybe a few years ago, now probably 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years ago, you could kind of get away with that because a yeah. general knowledge of the law was enough. Right. Um, I just don't think, unfortunately, like, and I'm not, you know, I'm not saying it's necessarily a great thing, but a general knowledge of the law these days is just not quite enough to, in fact, it's far from enough to help you build a successful practice. Yeah. Well, there's too many areas now and there's been too many laws in the last 40, 50 years that you can't be a general practitioner very, very effectively. And that's why there's so many niches and why people get into niches because you can learn a niche. It's it's difficult. I was a general person, a guy for the first five years because the guy I started with, uh, he was for 25 years and that's what he did. And I'm like, no, I want to go into the real estate side. I'm leaving the litigation behind all that because there's just a lot I can focus on there. But I can tell you that delineating that ideal client and figuring out who they were led me to be able to find out where they hang, hung out and what they wanted from me and, and what kind of marketing that I could put in front of them that would interest them. And it, man, it just totally opened doors like I could never believe. And so, yeah, it's so amazing. Yeah. 
Dan, we got a few minutes left, but I guess, you know, when you're thinking, a lot of people who listen to this, this podcast are either frustrated with the law and they want to leave. How do I get out? Others are frustrated, but they, they know their unique genius, their skill is really to be in the law, but they're having trouble with, with marketing or work-life balance. They never see their kids, whatever it is. But I mean, you know, what, you know, what advice either, you know, coming from your position in the industry, coming from AVO or just based on your experience, what sort of advice or tips or tricks to, for people to, to be happy as an attorney? What, what comes to mind? Yeah. So uh, I think, man, I, I mean, I think I'd just go back to, I guess I'd say two things. The first thing I'd say is this question of like figuring, figuring out what you do well and, and what you want. Yeah. Right. And, and like, and, and it's totally okay if you just want to be, well, I mean, the ivory tower practitioner is probably gone, but I know a lot of people who are like, I do legal research really well. Yeah. That's what I want to spend my time doing. And that's totally okay. But then you've got to figure out how are you going to be able to sustain yourself kind of doing that and, right. then, you know, kind of having that honest conversation and then, and then really being sort of honest and, and direct about like, okay, if this is what I want, sort of, how do I, how do I go about doing that? And, and if it makes sense for you to, and I, again, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I fundamentally believe that when you kind of find if, um, and I'm, 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 I'm blanking at Casey, you call it the unique genius. I've talked with other folks. It's sort of, it's this intersection of, um, oh yeah, it's, it's like what, what feels good to you and, and what you do well. And like, Frequently, those things, they, they have a pretty good overlap, right? And so, like, when you sort of find that space, um, you're probably operating in a space where you're going to be, again, this, I'm, just, I'm just channeling yeah. you now, you're going to be doing that thing that you do better than most people. That's right. And then it's just a question of, and, and this is new, right? This next piece is new. I just fundamentally believe, for good or for bad, the world of work has changed. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, again, for good or for bad, like, unfortunately, like we can't plug into a firm or a company that, you know, that's going to employ us for 20 or 30 or 40 years. And, and, and I'm not, I can't, uh, there, there are challenging things about that. It creates a lot of uncertainty. That's right. Um, but so once you find that thing that you do well, the next question is, okay, sort of how can I grow in that? But also how can I, how can I align myself, whether it's with the company, whether it's with the network, whether it's, you know, through marketing, how can I situate myself so that I can do that and then sort of grow in it? So I guess yeah. the things I would say are, A, figure out what it is you do well. You, you've got to do that. Figure out that, figure out that unique genius, that home base, whatever it is. And then the next piece is, you know, be, be honest or be willing or, or acknowledge that, hey, you're, you're going to have to hustle. You're going to have to, and, and, I, and I fundamentally believe that even if you get employed, right, like me, like I now have a job with a steady paycheck where like I don't have to hustle for the next client necessarily coming in the door, but I am constantly, maybe even too hard, pushing myself to think like, okay, what's the next step for me? What yeah. do I need to be doing? What, what are the skills I need to be honing? Who are the people I need to be meeting? What are the connections right. I need to be making? And, and again, like right or wrong, I think, I think that's the, the way that the world has evolved today. And, and that's how people need to be thinking. It's so, you're so right on there, man. And I have an experience from a, a client who, who is leaving the law. And, but you know what she's totally into is e-discovery loves data, loves e-discovery, mm -hmm. has kind of a moral obligation to protect information and do it right and just loves it. And so kind of an introvert, um, wouldn't mind being in front of a screen all day doesn't really want to do document review from the get-go, like doesn't want to be in a room doing that, but is starting with that ultimately with some networking she's done to really start getting into, not as a lawyer, but more of as a consultant and a business person to get into the e-discovery space. And you're sitting there going, doc review, boring doc review is, is kind of this segue into this right. whole kind of cool place. And it is, and I'm so happy for her. And there's steps ahead, but she really looked at, like you said, what she's good at. And part of it, she had to admit, she's like, I'm kind of good at doc review. Like I'm kind of good at, it's not, it's horrible to say, but she's kind of good at pulling this out and doing it. Like it comes easy to her. Obviously she doesn't want to do the rest of her life, but that really started the conversation 
to see what she was good at and what she wasn't good at. And just to be super transparent, like that it's so funny, right? Like when I went through that exercise, I was like, I want to speak and I want to write. Yeah. And like the super cynical lawyery part of me was like, a, of course everybody wants to do that. And B, who the hell's going to pay you to do That's that? Right. right? And, right. and you just have to own that. You right. just have to own it and be like, okay, this is what I do. You know, I might not, I might only be speaking to five people. I might be speaking in the mirror, like whatever that looks like. I'm going to, I'm going to get into that space yeah. and then I'm going to kind of push and I'm going to kind of grow and I'm going to, I'm going to talk to anybody who will listen, right. Or I'm going to, I'm going to write a bunch or whatever it is. I'm going to make all those connections and try to build something from there. It, it's so funny. A, a client in LA litigator, t- t- mid forties, 20 year litigating said the same thing. I love to write. I love to tell jokes. I love pop culture. Well, we've started talking with people in the online content creation space, content marketing, creating content for websites, you know, for Starbucks, for whatever. He looked at me and he goes, I had no idea online content creation was a space. But somebody would pay me for that. Yeah. That's right. And they will. So it can happen. You can All write right. it. We got it. We got to get Dan to his meeting. That's right. So yeah, Dan, absolutely. thank you so much. Yes. Point, though, this can exist in the law too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah. Easily. You, you can easily, you can find that thing. You can, you, you just have to be sort of fearless enough to let go and then right. kind of direct and committed enough to stay after it. That's right. That's Adam, good. where can we find you? Tell, tell everyone webpage, blog, Twitter. Uh, yeah. Uh, I am so Twitter is my social media drug of choice. Um, it's at Right Brain Law is where I spend a lot of my time. I also have a website, RightBrainLaw.co. Um, obviously, I would be remiss if I didn't mention my employer. I write a bunch for for um, our blog, so Avo.com is is where um, our company is found. Um, and then I write a bunch for our Lawyernomics blog, which is uh, Lawyernomics.Avo.com. Great, great. Awesome. Thanks so much. We'll have you back because there's a lot of other things we want to yeah, talk about. There is still lots of cool technology to talk about. So you guys, That's I, right. I'm, I, I don't know if you want me back, but I'd love oh, to. We do. we do. We do. We love we do. it. Dan, you've been great. Thanks, Thank man. You. Appreciate it. Everybody, thanks again for being part of the love, uh, love or Leave the Law community. Check us out on iTunes. Check us out on YouTube. Uh, please share the word. Email us if you have any questions for us or Dan or anyone. Um, but thank you again for being part of the community. We really appreciate it. Bye now. Bye, guys.